As the Blackstone Canal Company began its downward spiral, a new mode of transportation was clearly on the rise, the railroad. In 1848, the Providence and Worcester Railroad built a section of tracks down along the Blackstone River and along the east side of Queen Sigamon Village that would connect the two great cities of New England, Providence and Worcester. The P&W Railroad would also build a rail spur into the Washburn and Mowen rolling mill in Quinsigamon. Bob wire, telegraph wire, crinoline wire for the fashionable hoop skirts, and later springs for the expanding agricultural machinery industry, all were part of Washburn and Mowen's wire empire. And central to all this growth were the use of Swedish iron bars in the Washburn and Mowen's mills. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, National Park Service Ranger here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And the tall weeds, the boarded up windows, and the rusty railroad tracks belie the real significance of this area. But this was the site of Washburn and Mowen's giant south works for their huge wire industry here. Historians will tell you that America's wire industry was born right here in Worcester, Massachusetts. And such an expanding industry required workers, knowledgeable, industrious, hardworking, thrifty, and sober workers. And the industrial and urban centers of Sweden provided just such a worker. By 1910, the city of Worcester had the largest Scandinavian population of any city in America in relation to its size. So join me as we explore the Swedish influence here in the Blackstone Valley. From Worcester to East Providence, the Swedes played a key role in the industrial successes and the ethnic tensions of the Blackstone Valley. very proud of being a Swede and because um, well I've been, been brought up that way and my dad used to be so proud of being a being a Swede and uh, and I know I know I wish the only thing I wish that they had done was to speak Swedish to me so I could have learned the Swedish language I learned it more by association as I grew older he wanted, he wanted to speak perfect English. Not only that, he wanted us to speak English. He didn't want us to speak Swedish. So there wasn't very much Swedish, Swedish spoken around the house, especially when, when they got down to the youngest person, who was me. None of us spoke Swedish. He didn't want us to speak Swedish. He wanted us to be an American, through and through. And I think that's probably the reason why my grandfather made that donation to the Lincoln Historical Society. He wanted to be considered an American, not a Swede. Early on, it almost appeared as if everybody did have a Swedish name. So all of the people that were hired by Norton, for the most part, had to have had some Swedish derivation. And then as a result of them being employed, their relatives, friends, that they would recommend who were Swedish would automatically be hired also, had they met the qualifications. But it was predominantly Swedish for many, many years. Maybe that's one of the reasons it was a great company. <laughs> Standing here in the center, in the heart of Quinn Sigmund Village, right by its newly renovated school. And you can tell from the vast size of the school, as well as their ability to capture some of the historical accuracy of the architecture, that education is very important to the people of Quinn Sigmund Village. Matter of fact, if you were a Swedish immigrant to this country, one of the most important documents you would bring with you were your report cards. 
Proof of a good education, hard working with good attendance, was very important to any prospective employer. Now, why did the Swedes come to Worcester? Why didn't they go to the upper Midwest like so many of their other countrymen did? And why was the Swedish immigrant experience here so vastly different than other immigrants, such as the Irish and French Canadians and the Italians? Why were the Swedes treated differently? We'll answer those questions. We're going to catch up with our good friends, Dr. Charles Estes and Dr. John McClymer of Assumption College, authors of the book, Go to America, who are sitting right behind us at the First Swedish Methodist Church. It's going to be a lively discussion, folks. This should be good. Come on. What brought the Swedes to Quinsigman and Worcester in the first place, and why did they stay? Well, this village uh, was first uh, settled by Swedes who had grown up with and learned the iron culture of Vermland, Sweden, in south central Sweden. Uh, the, they had come from a community called Degefors um, in Vermland, southern Vermland, uh, where they had all been uh, members of an organizing group forming the First Methodist Church there in Sweden. Members of that church then immigrated to the United States and to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, where the first iron ranges were opened up uh, in the United States and worked those ranges. Um, and then, we're not sure how, but discovered uh, the developing iron and steel industry here in Worcester. And in 1875, uh, five or six families, families, not individuals, but families, migrated from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan to Quinsigaman Village and opened the floodgates to hundreds and hundreds then who followed them in the uh, decades that followed. It turns out if you look at migration patterns that people from the same part of one country, we're talking village here as well as larger areas, but you know, down to the village level, will all go, or many of them will go to the exact same place in the US. They'll go to the same neighborhood in Cleveland so people in Degas Force will come to Quinsigmund Village in Worcester, and that's quite common is the way migration works. But how those chains first form is what's hard to figure out, and we really wanted to be able to find that piece of paper somewhere which would say there was somebody from Worcester who was interested in recruiting Swedes and get them to work in the wire industry here because they were so happy to see, the, the employers were so happy to see the Swedes when they showed up, but there was no such connection, so. They came from an iron culture in Sweden, so they were skilled. Uh, many grew up as little boys learning to sort or um, learning to work as uh, young apprentices in the smelters. The steel work is most of them came from the province of Armland, and they used water power for their toys there, a small stream. And of course, the hammers and the mills were, as well, all the equipment was run by water power. But my grandfather made three of these and we're going to repair it. But the, maybe Kyle, you can turn the crank. I can hold it here. This lifted the crank up. So we've got to make a piece to go on here. And then there was another piece that came over the top to keep the hammer from flying up too high. So it was a replica of the old hammers and the old mills. And of course, another thing about the Swedish people in, in Worcester, most of them that came here were, were tradesmen. They were not, not farmers. They had, uh, many of them were dye makers and they had other trades in the steel industry. When you asked earlier, Chuck, about why they were so welcomed here, uh, they're also literate. Um, they came uh, as a literate industrial labor force. Um, uh, people who had grown up in that folk school tradition where not simply the elite were educated, but now the, the common person was educated in these, in these folk schools uh, with rudimentary education. And as part of some of the things they brought with them were their, their school records, uh, like their diplomas and what we would call report cards, were a very important part of the, the equipment that you brought to show your Yankee employer that uh, you were a, a very important kind of person to work in, uh, in the industries of the city. I was sent over to the Rodno, 
Man, that was really something, you know, to see these big billets go into a furnace and then be drawn into rods. And there was a man standing with a pair of tongs and the, the hot, this hot rod would come out and he'd have to swing it around his head like that and put it in the dye. And each pass made it smaller. And then when it came out, it came out and it was coiled, came out on a carrier. And my job was to stand alongside these, now they weren't red hot now, but they were hot, and put wire ties on them as they went along. Now, this was a time uh, when there was a great deal of ethnic and cultural religious tension, not just in Worcester, but across the country. And the previous large migration groups to come in were Irish and French Canadian, were very Catholic groups, both of them. And there was a good deal of tension over the public schools, over Charles is referring to temperance, to in Worcester, this took a, the form every year of a vote on whether or not saloons would be licensed. So every year, Worcester citizens got the chance to vote themselves wet or dry. On only four occasions did they vote dry, but some of the elections were very close, and it kept the politics roiling throughout. And so when the Swedes show up, they fit into this cultural alignment in a particular place, and they know where they fit, and the Yankees know where they fit, and it's on the opposite side from the Irish and the French Canadians. Our colleague uh, in this enterprise, Professor Kenneth Monaghan, calls it a partnership between the, the Protestant Swedes and the Yankee leadership. Um, and that's why, Chuck, we called our book Go Teal America, which means a, a stroll, not a journey, not an arduous trip, not a wrenching experience, but simply a stroll to America, as if you were going downtown to look for a job. Uh, they felt themselves so welcome, so much a part of the industrial developing Worcester uh, that uh, they simply strolled to America. They didn't journey uh, or travel, but took a walk. Saturday night, what was it like in Quinn Sigmund Village? It was very lively. I mean, despite what we've been saying about the absence of saloons and the no place where you could buy tobacco, but there were endless dances. There were endless music recitals. There were just all, I mean, in a church like this, we tend to think of churches as existing strictly for religious purposes. And of course, that's the central mission. But they also organize just endless activities. And so in some ways, when you talk about a church being a social center, you have this notion that everyone comes and prays. And everyone does come, and they do pray, and they're very serious about that, but they also dance or they play musical instruments, or they give concerts, or they put on plays, or they organize athletic teams. Uh, so there's a great deal that's going on. I played various bands that would dig up to play at dances. And we also had a church basketball league. And there were different activities of that type that we had for entertainment. I started singing uh, right after I got confirmed, I joined the junior choir because ever since I was a little girl, I guess because I loved the singing so much, even when we were in Sunday school. At the age of 18, I went into the wire mill to work, American Steel and Wire, which every kid in Quinsig seemed to do at that time. And uh, amongst the workers in there were two brothers, by the name of Momberg. And the village of Quinsig was, had no, with the except, one exception, had no liquor. Stag and I were walking home from work one day and he says, see that empty store over there? He says, I'm going up and apply to have a beer permit to sell beer and that. And I looked at it and I said, Stag, when I go to church on Sunday morning, every church in the village, and there were about five or six of them, will have some kind of a petition in there to be signed. And sure enough, Sunday morning, there was a petition against, <laughs> against the beer parlor, and it never did go through. When it came to singing for the Crown Prince, we, were, we belonged to the, what we call, Fromort Club, which uh, is a children's club, and it was part of the Boss Order of America. And uh, 
the at that time, it was uh, we had uh, well, I would say around forty children that attended those uh, meetings, or well, that was learning Swedish and learning the songs and did the dances and everything. So we had to go to Cambridge to compete to see who would be chosen to uh, sing for the Crown Prince. And I happened to be singing in this trio at the time. So uh, we, we, had, we had our pianist that used to play for us, she composed A Cœur du Ungadura and, and uh, Norlending's Hemlington, which uh, are two Swedish songs that we learned in trio. And uh, we competed with those two songs, and we happened to be chosen one of two acts that were going to go to the to sing for the Crown Prince. Coming home from school, there was an Anderson and Sunquist market, and you wouldn't remember, but in those days they had sawdust on the floor. And they used to sweep that up every once in a while, of course. But the the cookies came in in boxes about that square. And they had a kind of a celluloid cover that they could lift up. They had them in a rack. Yeah, and if you ordered, wanted a pound of cookies, they would open this cover up and put their hand in and put them in a bag. Nothing was packaged in those days. And occasionally one would fall, you know, in the sawdust. And we would run home from school and try to get an Anderson Sunquist first to pick up any, any cookie that had fallen in the sawdust. Yeah. But certainly there was music and singing uh, in yeah. all the congregations on, on Saturday night. But you're right, no barroom brawls, no <laughs> loose living on the streets, not at all. Unlike many ethnic groups, the American dream really worked for the Swedes. Embarrassingly so, as we tell our students. Yeah. Uh, it did. It really worked. And it, and Socially, it, politically, economically. Because... As your question implies, there was always a pecking order among ethnic groups, people standing in line, you know, and first in line were the Yankees, and they got first dibs on whatever was out there. And standing second on line in Worcester were Swedes, and they got to pick what was still there. And depending on where you were in line, and every ethnic group knew this, there was only so much going to be left for you. And if same, some group like the Swedes came in after you and moved ahead of you in the line, that engendered a considerable amount of bitterness. The only thing that made the line tolerable for most ethnic groups was the sense that some group would come in after you would be even further down the line and you would be pushed up just because there was now someone else below you. Uh, but for a group to cut in, as the Swedes did, engendered a good deal of tension, as you can imagine. One of the uh, industries here that developed out of the wire industries that are making screws and, and uh, that sort of thing, we're told that this lad's grandfather, or great-grandfather, I can't remember, would literally go down the line of workers lined up seeking employment and look for Swedes in that line and would pick them out of the line that is in front of the Irish or in front of any, any other immigrant mm. worker waiting for work. Quite literally, it was a visible preference expressed for, for the Swedish worker. Yeah. Of course, I grew up with the idea of Norton. Everybody I knew, all the adults at any rate, worked here. My, parent, my father worked here. And I had decided at one point that I was going to see about getting a job here at Norton also. I went, this was in 1950. I went to the employment office after having talked to my father that I was going to go over there. But in the meantime, what he had done was he had talked to his superintendent to say that uh, another potential Norton person was coming to the employment office. When I came into the employment office at that time, there were probably 50 people waiting to be hired. Well, as it, as it turned out, my father's superintendent came in with the employment manager. I did, I did have an acquaintance with both of them. The employment manager made a loud announcement, we are not hiring today, except for him. <laughs> That's how I started working at Norton. If you were to look back on a Swedish presence here, 
What influence do the Swedes have? When we first got into trying to understand Worcester generally, uh, one of the striking features was that uh, there was no viable union movement in the city, though it was the largest industrial center in New England. No unions until after the Second World War. That's very strange. Secondly, that uh, here was an industrial city full of immigrant populations in the labor force, dominated mostly by the Republican Party. Now, you do not find that in industrial centers that make great use of immigrant labor. Uh, the Democratic Party usually is, is certainly viable, if not more successful. Uh, and that was a puzzle to us until we found the Swedes, um, that that important block of human beings, uh, Protestant, uh, publicly temperate, hard workers, disciplined Republicans, uh, were the swing population in many major issues within the city. And so I would say, uh, in many ways, they, their real impact is to make Worcester a very unique, very fascinating industrial center uh, in, in American history. It does make Worcester a very interesting and unique place. Uh, part of the, what's interesting about the Swedes, you know, a lot of that lasting impact uh, is invisible because of their tendency to see themselves as fitting so cleanly and completely into that English-speaking world. Yeah, but the subtext continues to be a very strong Swedish influence. And so it was, a stroll to America. Now, the city of Worcester doesn't have a corner in the market as far as Swedish heritage goes. All you have to do is travel further down the river to East Providence to learn about a whole new and very different Swedish community. Now, the story relates to freshness baking powder, and a Rumford Chemical Company. So let's join our good friends at the East Providence Historical Society, and maybe if we play our cards right, we'll get a chance to sample some really good Swedish bread. Come on. We're here at the Handy Bake Shop in the uh, village of Rumford in East Providence with Edna Annis. And Edna is a curator for the John Hunt uh, Historical House and Museum. But we're talking about the Swedes, and the Swedes had an influence here in East Providence as well as Worcester, didn't they, Ann? Right. Why did they come to East Providence? What was the draw? Well, one of the draws was uh, the Rumford Chemical Works uh, sent recruits uh, from the uh, company to the Boston Port of Entry and encouraged the Swedes to come down here to work at the Rumford Chemical Works. Uh, the first ones arrived in 1871. No kidding, and they actually sent agents out there to recruit workers? Because they knew they were hardworking and industrious. No kidding. Now we're here in the uh, what has become uh, almost known as a, as a Swedish bakery, uh, the Handy Bake Shop. What's the connection between Rumford Chemical and the Swedish bakers? Well, um, the Rumford Chemical Works uh, exported baking powder all over the world as far south as Australia and uh, throughout Europe. And the bakers quickly in Sweden became aware of the rising capabilities of the baking powder. They had one problem, however. Uh, it was damp up there, and between bakings, if they didn't use the whole can of baking powder, uh, when they went back to use it the second time, the, the raising elements would have been altered. And so they persuaded the Rumford Company to export their cans in these small uh, one-ounce uh, sizes. And they came in these boxes, um, eight dozen to a box, and you can see they're printed in, in Swedish, and, and the box is printed. This way, the baker could do his weekly baking uh, and uh, throw the can away when he finished it. Or if he only had a little left, he would throw it away and he wouldn't be wasting a lot of money. And then he would open the next new smaller can when he baked the next time. So baking powder was very well known uh, in Sweden. And that too could have been one of the reasons why people heard about the Brunford Baking Powder uh, Company. Also, there were people in the area, such as Ellen Jensel, who lived across the street here, who went back to Sybil, Sweden, and recruited uh, men to come here to work at the Rumford. And she had a twofold interest. She ran a boarding house. And so the men who came into this area boarded with her, and as more and more came, her house got larger and larger. No kidding. No kidding. He came to this country in 1901. But when he came over, uh, he had already made arrangements to have uh, some sort of a job uh, in this, in this, uh, someplace to stay 
with a person by the name of Mrs. Jensel. Now, you've heard this name before. Mrs. Jensel was the mother-in-law of Gilbert Helgerson, who ran the, uh, the handy shop. And apparently, uh, she took in boarders from Sweden. They stayed in the cellar. She provided them with uh, food and uh, uh, comfort while they became acquainted in the area. This bakery that we're standing in is owned by Claude and Donna Duckworth, and Donna is of Swedish ancestry, and although this bakery did not open as a Swedish bakery, she, they use her recipes from her grandmother and her mother, and very uh, shortly after it opened, it became known locally as the Swedish bakery because of the excellent uh, breads that were made here. After 1882, when the Rumford Chemical Works had platted this area of Rumford, uh, for single-family uh, mill housing, uh, that uh, they needed a store local to the area that the workers' families could walk to instead of walking to across town to the Rumford uh, Market. And so this building next door was built as the Pioneer Food Store by Mrs. Jensel. And in 1925, Adolf, who married her daughter uh, and also was a carpenter, had nothing to do with the Rumford Chemical Works, uh, built where we're standing as a three-store uh, building. Only after he got it finished, he decided, you know, we need a, a local handy shop. And he sold housewares and hardwares and uh, clothing and towels and all that sort of thing, except, to quote him, the three evil items, liquor, uh, cigarettes, and filthy books. He was determined that he was not going to speak English with an accent. And he did. He spoke perfect English, impeccable English. He would occasionally, he would occasionally mispronounce a word like yellow. You know, if he got angry, he'd say jello. Or he was a machine shop foreman. He would say, he, he might say, that damn junior, they're trying to organize this factory, you know. But most of the Swedes had a profound accent, uh, a profound accent, although they spoke excellent English. English. On one hand, from the language standpoint, you yep. want to fit in, and so you did not, if I was to hear your dad speak, I would not know that he was Swedish. On the other hand, very strong supporter of the Swedish community. No question. There's a lot of duplicity. A lot of duplicity. Do you think that duplicity, and I, I find this again fascinating, was more a result of, of how hard it was to be an immigrant to the United States? And so I want to fit in so I don't get singled out? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, that was a large part of it. He didn't, he didn't want to be discriminated against. Now, I guess maybe he didn't mind dis being discriminated for and probably utilized the fact that he could speak Swedish with those Swedes who were, uh, you know, on a higher, higher level than him or than he. I think that's true. Well, this has been National Park Service Ranger Chuck Arning here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And the most fascinating aspect of the Swedish experience here in the Blackstone Valley is just how different it is from the other immigrant groups. It's not the same as the French Canadians or the Irish or the Cape Verdeans or from other immigrant groups. They came here with a specific goal in mind and with a, chose a path that they believe would get them to their dream of a future here for themselves and for their families. And I guess what it tells us is that being an immigrant to the United States is not an easy path. We all came from somewhere, and just perhaps we might make it easier on those newcomers as they try to make their way into American society. So until next time, hope to see you in the valley.